Um, all right, so should we get started? Yeah. All right. Um, I am just doing this because Matea couldn't make it, unfortunately, today. But uh, please welcome everyone to Pietro Arbiero. He is currently a student, a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge, um, as well as a research assistant at the Universidad de la Cispera Italiana. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly, so I'll do my best. Um, in Switzerland, unfortunately, he couldn't make it in person, but yeah, today he's going to be talking about interoperable neuron symbolic cognitive reasoning. So go ahead and take it. Thanks. Thank you so much for the introduction. And well, this was a paper. Uh, the, today's talk would be about a paper we recently collaborated with Matteo. Uh, and the paper was recently accepted at the ICML. So uh, today's talk would be about this topic. And to talk about this paper, let me start with introducing the two main characters of this talk. Uh, this, paper, this talk is about uh, two characters. One is a researcher in AI and the other one is a machine. And this talk would be about how, like, how we make these two uh, characters to communicate to each other in an efficient way. And we're interested in a specific problem in this communication. And the topic of this talk is how to make the researcher in AI happy. And uh, to do that, the question is, how should we model the communication channel and how should we model the machine such that the, the expert in AI is happy about this interaction? And at least this is one, of course, this topic won't cover all the possible interactions with machines. We are going to deal with a specific kind of interaction I will introduce, I will introduce in a few slides. So the kind of interaction we are talking about is um, sort of a discussion between the, the expert and the machine. And the kind of interaction involves two questions the expert in AI may ask to the machine. And the first question, question is related to what we call classification. So we ask a machine, what is this, what is that? And we expect an answer that matches our expectation. So if we ask, what is this? This is an apple, we are fine. We know this is an apple. And um, we can, we can like, th this kind of interaction is good um, from a researcher point of view. The second kind of question we may want to ask machines is why do you think this is an apple? So what's, what are the main features? What are the reasoning behind your prediction? And again, we expect from, from machines something like, uh, like, I don't know, this is an apple because it's round and red, like two features that are common of, to most apples. And um, if we get a reasonable, answer like this, we might be happy. I won't deal, delve into all the details about whether the machine should use con specific uh, words or others. Um, we are just giving a very high level overview of what kind, what, what kind of answer we may look for. And this kind of interaction is in an ideal world, of course, like this would be the idea. In the ideal world, we should get some interaction like this, where the the questions uh, are simple and the the answers are correct. However, when we uh, go into the real world, these may not apply anymore. So, if we replace a human expert with an actual expert, and when we replace the machine with a one of the machines we we deal with, like. Uh, I don't know, a neural network, uh, the kind of interaction is actually different. So we may ask, in one case, we may ask a question like, what is this image? What does this image represent? And we can have uh, an interaction when the machine, when the, where the machine misclassifies um, the sample. Or we can have another kind of interaction where the classification is actually correct, but the machine is not able actually to give an answer for why this image was classified in a specific way. And again, this kind of interaction is not really satisfying for, for our expert. 
so the talk today's talk would be more or less how we can make this expert happy in a way that um, like this interaction is actually satisfactory. And um, today's guest expert is um, my PhD uh, advisor, Pietro, who, who kindly offered as a, a domain expert for today's talk. And, and like I would spend just one second saying I'm really grateful for Pietro uh, for the during for everything happened during my PhD and everything he did for me. So how can we decompose happiness, uh, the happiness of, a, of the uh, expert in AI in a way that uh, we can use this information to, to, to design a better interaction? So in, in the first kind of interaction where the, the, our model was not providing the correct answer for the classification, um, but a reasonably good explanation. Uh, we may say the explanation quality is fine, but the performance in solving the task was actually very poor. So we have sort of a compromise, which leans toward um, a good explanation. While in the opposite case where the classification was actually correct, but the explanation we got was somewhat not really satisfying, we have another sort of compromise, uh, which leans toward uh, the task performance. Now, the problem is that the expert is actually not satisfied until um, we get something in between. So in, in the real world, um, the situation A is represented by interpretable models. These kind of models are models that are really good at providing explanations, but may struggle in solving more complex tasks. And on the other hand of the spectrum, we have what we call black boxes, like deep neural networks, which may solve challenging tasks really um, with a really good performance, but they may struggle in providing good explanations. And as I was saying, like the having a balance between these two objectives is what may improve happiness in our, in our um, human experts in the interaction uh, with this sort of machines. So what we may want to achieve is a machine that is very good at solving tasks, but also provides very good explanations for uh, its predictions. And this is a not, not as in, an easy task. So we, the idea was how can we uh, what's the path we should take in order to uh, make our machine, our concrete uh, machine learning model to perform better and to improve in both these objectives. So to do this, let's go back a bit to and have a look at the, let's try to give, get some hints about how can we solve this problem by looking at the interactions uh, we were discussing at the beginning. And specifically, we can focus on uh, this answer, the answer to the why question. And here we I highlighted two components of this answer. Um, and these are um, interesting components because they give some properties the humans can check whether they are actually correct or not. They, they give some properties about the image we are talking about. Um, and these are really basic components in this case, uh, the, the concept round and the concept red. And one question could be, why are these, con these words important and what are actually these concepts? What is a concept in general? What are, what are, we, do what, what are we dealing with? What, why do we like these concepts? So, Let's have a look at these concepts, the concept round and the concept red. What are these concepts? How can we define these concepts in a concrete way? Well, if we take the concept round, uh, we can have a qualitative definition of the concept round by representing uh, um, different things that are round, like a wheel, a pizza, or an, a slice of an orange. They are all round. So 
we can give examples for the concept round this way. And we can do the same for the concept red. Uh, cherries are red, dice are, there, are red. So we can give examples uh, of the concept we are talking about. And in fact, uh, given the set of all objects and the set of attributes, what is actually a concept? What is the concept red? The concept red is, in, is, um, is the image of two, like of this function that takes a set of objects, it takes uh, an attribute and it gives you the tuple, the set of concept, the objects that are red. And uh, this is actually very general. There is a theory, a formal theory about concept that describes how these functions behave and other interesting stuff. But for the sake of this talk, we just we can just define concepts as these tuples. Um, and one like this may be intuitive or not. Um, and for like we use concepts every day, but it's not actually obvious how to use these concepts uh, to improve the interaction between humans and machines. So the usual kind of model we have um, goes from an input X, like, an, in, like a, an input of images and tries to predict a label for each image. This could be a gen, like a typical setting in, in machine learning. And a few years back, um, someone proposed uh, a different approach, uh, which involved the use of concepts inside this, um, the usual architecture of, of a neural network. And the idea was to split uh, the architecture in two parts. The first part um, was focusing on extracting some features from the input space and map these features into a concept space. And then the second function, the second architecture was uh, taking these concepts as input and trying to solve the task using these concepts. So this is one possible way of using concepts in a neural network. And it's interesting because now, since we have these concepts within the architecture, we can give answers to why are we looking at, like why then the network can actually give some answers for why it gives a prediction for a specific uh, class, like why is this image an apple, by looking at the concepts that were relevant for this prediction. So in this case, uh, the concept round and red were active. So we can say that we are, this is an apple because the concept round and the concept red were active and the others were not. So this is a way to use concepts within an architecture. And the question now is, like I know how more or less that we I can represent a concept with a with a tuple of objects and attributes, but how can I represent a concept within a neural architecture? So the standard answer, the the, the one of the possible easiest answers uh, would be to represent a concept with a probability or a truth degree, like the probability that the concept is there or something like that. A reasonable option. Another option is to represent concepts um, using vectors, using embeddings. This is typically the way neural networks encode these concepts uh, in their latent space. Um, it's harder to know which concepts, uh, which concept uh, are we talking about if we just look at a cluster of embeddings. Um, while the symbolic uh, way of representing a concept is more intuitive in the way we can assign the semantics to each uh, symbol, to, to each one of these neurons that give us the probability or the truth degree. Of course, these two sort of representations represent different uh, compromises between our um, explanation, uh, in, in our accuracy explainability trade-off we were discuss discussing before. So using a symbolic representation within a neural architecture usually gives more stable explanations 
that are easier to understand for humans because, well, these are actually the representation of a truth degree or a probability we know we are talking what we are talking about more or less. While representing a concept with a vector is a bit more challenging in terms of provide, like it's more challenging to provide to provide explanations using these vectors because we don't know exactly what we are talking about. So the, the quality of the explanations and the quality of the interaction with humans is um, a bit deteriorated. But the task performance is, um, if we use, if, you, if we are just happy of using embeddings to represent concepts is usually um, a bit better. We are, we are giving less constraints and we have more expressive power uh, in this way. So, a question uh, we we were dealing last year with with Matteo and and the other colleagues was how can we combine these two representations to provide a better trade off between explanation quality and task performance. So how can we achieve this golden star in the top right corner? And one option uh, we we were discussing and we, we, we worked on last year and we published at NeurIPS was to use both representations. So um, uh, represent, like we try to represent concepts using both uh, the symbolic and the neural information at the same time. For a single concept, each concept would be represented both by a probability and by an embed or a composition of these two elements. I won't talk about today. So the hypothesis is if I combine these two elements, should I, should I really get close to the golden star? And in some cases, the answer is yes. Um, for most cases, the trade-off is much better. Sometimes you don't get close to the 100% task accuracy because the task is really hard, but the compromise you would get is usually is typically better, and um, this was the topic uh, we mainly worked on last year. Now, we may wonder: Would this make our expert actually happy about the interaction with the machine? Let's see. Actually, it doesn't, and you may wonder why. Well, let's see at the structure um, of the interaction. So if we are just using the symbolic representation for concepts, then we have this architecture that we were discussing before. Um, and if we just look at the right part of this um, image, like the network on the right can be somehow provide good explanations because by just looking at the probability or truth value of concepts, you can have a hint of which concepts are useful, what kind of information the network is using to predict that the, this image contains an apple. And in this case, our expert might be happy. However, if we use the embeddings as we plan to in, this, uh, in the concept representation, then how do we know whether a dimension, a different dimension in the embedding is actually relevant or not? And what does it mean? So the problem is that I can say in this case that I'm seeing an apple because the concept round has a high probability, but what about the embedding round? What, what does it mean to have a, like a relevant dimension number two of the embedding round? That's not actually clear. So that's why we cannot use these embeddings to actually give good explanations, of, like intuitive explanations at least, for uh, the prediction. And that's what what's the recent work is about. So how can actually we can we can we improve um, the model that goes from our concepts to our task in such a way that we use the embeddings? but we use the embeddings in a way that the explanations are still meaningful. And I will give you a simple example for why 
um, for why the even standard interpretable machine learning models are not enough to solve this problem. So imagine we have this setting where we have two concepts, a concept yellow and the concept round, and we want to predict the task, uh, do I see a banana or not? And let's assume these are the truth degrees, but it's just an example, don't, don't care about that. So imagine we want, to we, we want to use a standard interpretable classifier like a logistic regression or a decision tree to map these concepts to this task. Let's, let's pick a log logistic regression because it's easier to visu visualize. And let's pretend we don't care about the embeddings. In this case, our expert is happy. Why? Because a logistic regression would associate a weight to a learnable weight to each of the concept truth degrees. And after training, we can, we can say that if a weight is very close to zero, actually the concept is not really important. If the absolute value of the weight is high, then the concept might be relevant for, for the task. It's a heuristic, it's, it doesn't work every time, but somehow this is something uh, uh, the people working in explainable AI are happy with. It's a sort of explanation, it's not perfect, but it works. Now, what if we plug in the embeddings? Now, after training, we also have weights connecting the, the individual dimensions of the embeddings to the task. And the meaning of having a weight connected to the third dimension of the embedding yellow to um, the task banana what is not really clear. What if this, um, this weight has a high absolute value? What's the higher order interaction with the other embeddings and the other truth degrees? We don't have a clue actually. So this is the reason why, even if we use a standard interpretable model, we don't really get good explanations because we cannot assign a semantics to the individual dimensions of the embeddings. Now, this is the main motivation behind our work. And our work is based on the idea of splitting the work of the model that is mapping concepts to tasks. And we split this computation in two parts, such that the first part only uses the embedding of each concept. And the second part only uses the truth degrees. The first part, the first component is a rule generator. It takes as input the embeddings of each, the, the embedding of each concept, and it returns a representation of a logic rule, which is interpretable. It's just a syntactic representation of the logic rule. Well, where the components of this lo logic rule are the, um, the attribute names of our concepts, representing our concepts. And the second part of the architecture is, um, it, it just takes this rule as input and it plugs in the concept truth degrees to get a prediction. And again, this like, so, for each prediction, we are making the prediction using a logic rule, which is interpretable. So in some way, we can say that the final prediction is also justified by this logic rule. Like we are taking this prediction, I'm saying this is a banana because this, and I give you the logic rule, this is a yellow uh, image and it's not round. We know banana is generally typically not round. And the trick was to make like the, the hard part was to make this process end to end differentiable. So if we have a perceptive input to like an yeah, space, an input space that is from images or a graph or anything, we can still use a neural network to extract features and then make interpretable predictions on top of that. 
Now, I will I'll try to give you a, a more in-depth um, look at how can we achieve this. Um, but I will give you, I, I'll try to give you an example and show and show you how it works looking at an, an example that it could be easier. You'll tell me at the end of the talk whether I succeeded. So let's start with a simple example um, where we want to describe the what is a banana given three concepts. The concept soft, round, and yellow. So how can we do that? So the first thing we can look at is the polarity of each of these three concepts. So do we want to use the concept as it is, or we, do we want to negate the concept? Are we, is a banana something that is round or something that is not round? Is it yellow or not yellow? So this is the first thing we should learn. And the second thing is, are, like, are all these concepts relevant? Can, can I remove some of these concepts and still get um, a good explanation? Because if I can, then I don't need them. They are not actually really important, these concepts. A good explanation is useful and readable from a human being if it's short enough such that the human being can read it. So imagine if we have hundreds of concepts um, and every time we get an explanation, we get a hundred of information, a hundred of terms. It's hard to read it. If we get, we only need this the shortest possible explanation in order to, to get something that a human can read. So we need to model the polarity of a concept, but also the relevance of the concept. And to do that, we can use still neural networks. So the polarity of a concept can be modeled by a neural network that predicts the polarity of the concept. And then it combines this information with the truth degree to represent the concept not round, for example. And again, we can have a second neural network that predicts the relevance of a concept. And we can now combine the two information uh, informations and then if something like the concept round um, is relevant, um, we know that it's actually the uh, concept round with a negative polarity you know, for the task banana. And we can repeat this process for the other concepts. Uh, the concept yellow, for example, has a positive polarity and we know it's relevant for, I don't know, for predicting a banana, for yellow bananas, I don't know. Um, and um, the concept soft, for example, is not actually relevant. So we don't even care about the polarity. We just overwrite whatever we get as output of the polarity and we just say it's not relevant. So we don't need it. And now we can combine these three informations to assemble the final logic rule that tells us that something that is not round and it is yellow, then it's a banana. That it works uh, in words, but it actually even works if we plug in numbers. So these neural networks are, have learnable weights so we can learn these um, in a, a differentiable way. However, here there are a few operations that are not exactly shown in this slide. They're hidden behind, the, behind this slide um, that are the logic operations. How can we make the logic operations differentiable? Here we are composing, for example, the polarity with the truth degree. How can we do that? How can we have a, an end that is differentiable? Well, I, I can show you the equations for, the, for these logic rules, uh, for these logic operations. I won't discuss the details of this, but what I can say is that um, the, in these equations, there are, you, you can see, you can recognize the concept truth value, uh, the concept embeddings, and the neural networks. So the neural networks, uh, you have one neural network for the uh, relevance of a concept, one neural network for the polarity of a concept, and each of these neural networks is taking as input the embeddings 
of a concept, just only the embedding of the concept. While the concept truth degree is not an input to any neural network. And all these oper logic operations, the if and only if, the implication, the end, you can see in this, in this slide, they can be represented with uh, operations that are differentiable using a T norm. You can pick the T norm and then you can get your differentiable operators. Um, some of these T norms are easier to optimize and they're, they are smoother and um, there are some compromises, but in the end, you can pick your own T norm and get uh, your end-to-end -end differentiable system. And this is, for example, um, what happens if you pick a, God, a Gödel T norm and uh, you can represent the if and only if using min and max operators and um, the implication with the max operation and the end with a uh, min operation. So that's more or less the way we can convert a logic operation into a differentiable um, equivalent and how we can have all this process end-to-end uh, -end differentiable. Now, we can, we can go back to our initial character and ask him whether he's happy now or not and why. So that's was, uh, that was the, the answer when we just plug embedding and use whatever model uh, on top of the concept embeddings. Now, but now we have another, we, we have a different model. We designed a model that is actually using the embedding information to generate logic rules, interpretable logic rules, and then using the logic rules to make predictions. So using our method, we can actually get back to the um, simple answer and say that this image contains an apple because it is round and red. Is Pietro happy now? I don't think so yet because I haven't shown you the, the results on, um, on some benchmarks, on some data sets, real world data sets. So uh, one of the first tests was to check whether this model, uh, the deep concept reasoning model was actually able to um, recover, like if, if we plug this model on top of, um, if you apply this model on, on a specific data set where we know the ground truth rules that should be recovered, can we actually get back these rules? And the answer is yes, um, using simple data sets, but also um, other less trivial data sets like the MNIST addition uh, data set that is a standard data set in uh, neural symbolic AI. The deep concept reasoner was actually able to recover always this, the, 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 um, the correct rules, um, the, the rules we would expect in uh, and they, they, can, they, they actually matched the ground truth. Second test was what's the compromise between the accuracy in solving the task and the interpretability? Because we know that interpretable models may struggle, may struggle in, um, in solving challenging tasks. But also in this case, the model we designed was able to strike a good balance between uh, the task predictions and the fact that this model was actually interpretable. So if you look at some of these data sets, like the central uh, data set, the dot data set, or the celeb task, uh, you can see that um, the blue bar that is representing our model is much higher than, than the other um, bars that are right on the uh, on the right um, under interpretable. The interpretable yes um, uh, group, which represents standard uh, models like logistic regressions or decision trees. Uh, so in solving challenging tasks, our model was actually much better in uh, predicting the task. Not it's not just that. Uh, we also compared the model uh, with existing neural symbolic systems that are trained using ground truth rules in during the training uh, phase. 
while our model is actually just taking the concepts as inputs, but the rules are unknown before training. Um, and still we get for some tasks, uh, like the MNIST addition task, uh, very good accuracy, closely uh, following the ones of neural symbolic systems. And, but there are also bonus uh, things uh, we, can, we can use uh, DCR for. One is that thanks to the logic rules, uh, the deep concept reasoner is able to predict, to, to um, uh, explain its own mistakes. Uh, in this case, it, it was not a mistake of the model. It was actually a mistake in the data generation process. For example, in the first row, you can see that um, for the uh, XOR data set, the concepts um, were um, negative. So we have two axes. Um, two concepts, the concept C0 and C1, they were actually negated and the rule is correct. So if you have uh, not A and not B, that's the, the XOR is um, uh, zero. Um, but the ground truth label um, that was used to train the model, like the, the ground truth label for the test set was one because the data generation process was, uh, there was an error in the data generation process. So uh, but the model was able to uh, to find the, the correct logic rule and uh, find the mistake in, in the in the data generation process. And another thing that is uh, interesting to mention is that using this model, using the logic rules, we can uh, compare the um, how easy. Uh, it is to generate counterfactual explanations. So how, what is the outcome of perturbing a feature and what is the, uh, would the, uh, what would the per, um, perturbing a feature affect the final prediction? What would have been uh, the prediction if this feature uh, was uh, different? That's the sort of question we ask when we look for counterfactuals. And the results is actually the results were actually quite interesting because uh, our model was um, showing a, a confidence that is really similar to the models that are considered interpretable, like uh, decision trees and logistic regressions that are typically used to extract counterfactuals, while other models like XGBoost have a significantly different behavior in when features are perturbed. Still, uh, the model had a few issues, a few limitations. One was that the global behavior of the model was not directly interpretable. This model was propositional in the sense that the logic rules uh, were specific for each sample. You can get a logic rule for each sample, for each input sample, so you don't see the global behavior uh, of the model explained in these logic rules. And the second limitation is that in most cases, you still need concept labels to have a stable train, which is a strong assumption. Even though we have a few data sets like the MNIST, MNIST addition data set where the concepts, we didn't have concept labels in some more challenging tasks, it's actually harder to um, train properly the model without this information, without these uh, labels. To recap, um, the idea was to design a model such that the interaction between um, an expert in AI and its machine uh, was satisfactory. And we, we were specifically um, dealing with and uh, interested in two sorts of questions, the what is something and why. And we try to um, identify a specific class of models that were trying to provide an answer for these two questions, which are the concept-based models. And specifically, we were looking at a good balance between um, in providing an answer and a correct answer for both these questions, for good prediction for the task and a good explanation for the why, uh, which, which is represented by 
the golden star in, in the right hand graph. And specifically, we focused on um, finding a good solution for concept based models. And the, a possible solution is to use the concept reasoning model, which is striking a good balance between accuracy and interpretability. And hopefully, it will also, uh, we, using this model, we can also make our user, we are, we, our expert in AI smile finally and being happy. Thank you so much for your attention. Can I have a question for, for Pietro Leo? Pietro, are you happy finally? <laughs> the whole the talk has been fantastic. So yeah, I great imagine. job, Pietro. Really. Yeah. Thank you, guys.